So uh, thanks for being here today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking. Are you feeling okay? I saw you had a cold. <laughs> well, you can kind of hear it in my voice. I'm a, a little, little froggy, <laughs> but uh, I'm feeling better today than I did yesterday. Oh, good. Yeah. So um, when did you uh, start writing your book and how long did it take you to finish it? Oh, boy, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, it All in all, it took about four years. Oh. But I, I have to qualify that because I had written for about a year and was making good progress. And then all of a sudden, the show I'm on, being General Hospital, decided to bring back a dead twin. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly I was working so hard, I didn't have time to write. I was up every day at 530 to go to the studio and pull off double duty uh, as Kevin and Ryan on GH. So I had to put it down for about a year. Oh. And then COVID hit <laughs> and I was able to pick it up again for about six months. And then, of course, the first shows to go back into production during COVID were soap operas. Right. I guess means we're, we're just a little bit expendable. So, <laughs> um, so well, I did have I, strict I, COVID protocols. So and we had very strict COVID parents. protocols. Yeah, we, we were a lot of masks, daily testing, you know, a lot of swabs in the nose. Um, but we picked up right where we left off. So I had to put the book down again. And that was probably another six months. And then it took me another year or so through several drafts, working with editors and getting it into a shape to actually submit. So all in all, the writing process took about two years, but the entire span was about four. Okay. And uh, did you have any difficulties getting it published? Amazingly, no. Uh, I mean, I look at my experience and my experience really was much easier than I think most people. Now, of course, I do have a little bit of a platform uh, in terms of followers and, you know, at Insta and Twitter. And I, I just can't seem to call it X. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> excuse me. I, um, I, I did go to uh, at the behest of an author who I had narrated because I have this little side hustle narrating audiobooks, sure. which is great for me because I just, I love books. Um, but one of those authors was the great Alex Finlay. He's one of the best thriller writers I've ever read. <laughs> and I wrote to him to thank him for the inspiration to get me over that hump and start actually writing a book. And he wrote me right back within five minutes and we've wow. since become good friends. Um, but he told me flat out, John, if you're serious about this, you have to go to the book conferences. Hmm. And being that you're a, a crime writer, which falls under thriller mysteries, you need to go to Thriller Fest, hmm. which is in New York every June. And it's it's huge. It takes over the entire hotel, the Sheridan Hotel in New York City. And uh, so I went. And that's where I actually pitched agents. Hmm. About 12 of them, because there's a thing there called Pitch Fest. And right. I highly recommend anybody do this because there's just something about sitting down in front of someone. Sure. And not only do they get a sense of you, you get a sense of who they are. And I met my agent there. I sat wow. down with a woman named Liza Fleisig from the Liza Royce Agency. And as soon as I sat down, I liked her. And I think she liked me because we sat and we talked for a few minutes before we even got to my pitch. Hmm. And. And that's who I eventually went with. And she was able to get a deal within a few months. And we had a few offers. Wow. Um, settled with Crooked Lane Books because they just kind of totally got the book. So it sounds more like what you do to pitch a, a series or a movie nowadays than the old time where you just sent in your manuscript. Yeah. Um, I, you know, that's where I had a bit of an advantage because mm -hmm. I have pitched movies and tv show ideas and things so i knew i knew the basics of how to pitch when they say five minutes that means get it down to three because you need a couple of minutes for them to ask questions if they're interested sure i got my pitch down to one minute 45 <laughs> <laughs> I, pardon me i really wanted to be succinct and straightforward and really nail it and um and Fortunately, that worked for me. I had I pitched 12 agents. I had 12 res requests for the manuscript. So what made you want to write a detective novel? Is that your favorite genre? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, one of my favorite writers was, is, was Elmore Leonard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great. I used to read his stuff all the time. Uh, and I, and I love the, you know, the OGs of the genre, the Raymond Chandler's Dashiell Hammett's, uh, you know, James Kane, you know, those guys just invented something that's very specific to Los Angeles mm -hmm. about that darkness that, that lurks underneath the sun and the palm trees and all right. that. It's a, uh, it's a really, to me, it's just a really layered, fascinating kind of setting for stories. So I've always loved it. So I just kind of, and you know, write what you know, I've been right. living most of my adult life here, except for a few years in New York. Mm -hmm. um, I've been here in Los Angeles since I was 20. Yeah. And so I, I know it pretty well. <laughs> oh, by the way, congratulations on getting on the USA Today bestseller list. Thank you. And also congratulations for 30 years being on General Hospital, over 30 years. That's amazing. I'm still off and on, but still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go and I come back. But you know what? As long as they keep asking. <laughs> right. <laughs> why not? <laughs> That's right. Well, I, yeah. I've been watching off and on since 84, mostly on. And so I remember when you started on the show. <laughs> wow, 84. Yeah. yeah, I was in college. So. That's when people get home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you don't have a grandma or mom watching, it's college that, that doesn't. Yeah. It's either that. college or I watched you with my grandma. That's yeah. what I use the time. <laughs> so, uh, what are some other uh, favorite authors in, or influences on your writing that you haven't mentioned yet? Well, film noir, definitely. Um, you know, my, my favorite Saturday night now is to stay home and watch TCM uh, because it, you know, Eddie Muller and Noir Alley comes on every Saturday night. Um, and he digs into a very deep library of of film noir in that canon that uh, that was really unlike anything else that was ever made before or since. And, you know, it was post war malaise. They were lower budget, so they often had to shoot at night when the rest of the studio was asleep. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so there was a lot of night shooting and a lot of use of light and shadow and you know beautiful uh, cinematography. So I I just uh, I, I don't know. There's something about that genre where your main character is is faced with a choice of mm -hmm. do it or don't do it. If I do it, whether it's for love or lust or greed or whatever, you know, even altruism, if I do this, there's a very good chance it will end me. Yeah. And he does it anyway. <laughs> So I, you know, there's something about having to make a choice like that, that I find very interesting. And uh, you were in Bosch, one of my favorite shows. Uh, what about Michael Connelly? Did you read a lot of him? Oh yeah. I was a big fan. I got turned on to Harry Bosch back in the 1980s uh, yeah. when he started writing them. And uh, so, yeah, to get a season of Bosch as one of his bad guys um, was, was was a bit of a dream come true and he's a lovely man he he oh, was okay. on set all the time that's nice I'm so sorry for this cold but um right. uh he uh you know he's a he's a big guy now i'm six one and he's <laughs> i got to look up at him <laughs> wow. you know um he you know but he was the crime writer for the la times for many years and right. he he's another one who really gets this city and really understands how to accurately portray crime sure. here and how it gets just kind of somebody asked me the other night we had our, our launch event uh at book soup up on sunset boulevard and there was a woman there who i didn't know but she asked a really good question she said what's the difference between la crime and new york crime hmm. and i thought wow that's i never thought of that but when i ha once i did I remember being down in Soho when I lived in New York and I came out of a restaurant or something and right across the street was an armored car that was waiting for the guys to come out and deliver the money. And I see him come out and this crowded street and the guy, you know, has his hand on the handle of his sidearm and he looks both ways and looks all around and then signals the guy to come out and they quickly yeah. got into that car that armored car and took off um and i thought that's the difference the crowd in new york it's like new york it's going to be in your face if you're going to hit that place you're going to hit it right in the middle of soho on a, yeah. on a tuesday afternoon <laughs> and it's you know it's like crime in your face 
Whereas here, it's all, it's easier to kind of hide it under something. It's all spread out. So it's so spread out here that it can happen. And it's like, if, <laughs> if a crime falls in the forest, is anyone here, <laughs> you know, it's a, <laughs> I imagine it's harder for them to find the culprit too, because if they're staying in the area, because they have so much more land to cover, whereas in New York, if they're going to be in that area, it's a lot easier. Traffic. And everybody knows you in New York. Yeah, that's true. Here, you know, again, there's another layer of this kind of hidden world. You know, I mean, fortunately, I know my neighbors. We all look after oh, each that's other. Good. Yeah, but uh, that's not always been the case in most places I've lived in L.A. No, I mean, in California, the whole door. thing is like that. I, I grew up there. I'm from San Diego, so we almost yeah. never knew my neighbors. Yeah. Um, now that we've lived, that's a strange there, phenomenon. Isn't it's it? it's uh it well it's funny because to me that's normal because that's how I grew up. But we've lived in the south. I'm in Arkansas right now. We I know oh. all the neighbors, and my husband just thinks it's weird <laughs> because he's also <laughs> from California. But it is nice to know your neighbors, <laughs> especially during the pandemic when we were out walking the dog and everyone was like, "Oh hi," because they were so happy to see um to adults, see anybody anybody yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anybody but their kids and their family you know? <laughs> but uh yeah so no, that's awesome i i understand that completely um and we're actually moving to new york in june uh we we lived there a long time ago uh in when i got into gh actually when i was in college so uh huh. are you moving yeah. to the city uh no but we're going to be about half an hour from there i understand um we don't actually know what town we're moving to yet. We have to find a place, but uh, he's work, going to work at SUNY uh, Old Westbury. I don't oh, know great. Well, congratulations. Enjoy Thank you. It. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I want to be in a city again, in <laughs> a small town here. <laughs> <laughs> I won't know my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I read some of the book. I haven't had time to finish it, but um, to me, the description of when sounds a lot like Steve Burton. Uh, at least physically. Uh, is that intentional? Well, Steve was no, no, no. Steve was <laughs> not an inspiration at all. There was a Steve, but it was Steve McQueen. Oh, okay. Well, they, they have a lot. No, of no it's not Steve Burton. Yeah. Steve, Steve's way too muscled for Win, Winston <laughs> Green. Um, no, my inspirations for Win were uh, were Steve McQueen, Kevin Costner, uh, in terms of physicality. Right. Um, you know, and I, I do describe him in there that a director that Winston had worked with described Winston Green as a landmine that's been stepped on and you're just waiting for you to step off before he blows. <laughs> you know, you know, he's wired tight. There's a there's an edge to him. And uh, but, you know, sadly, the other inspiration was uh, was really Tom Sizemore uh -huh. and some of the other people in my business who have who came to town with just brilliant talent i mean just you know you would take yeah. tom sizemore just look at his work in saving private ryan and heat and you know he was working with the very best of the best because they wanted him yeah yeah he's good. and you know and his demons got him and and it really sidelined his career and that's too bad you know yeah it, it was very sad but you know it's that's you know i've known a lot of guys like that mm. just their lives and careers have taken a hard left due yeah. to due to substance abuse and some made it and some didn't yeah. and I, well i'd like to see winston as somebody who made it and got himself together um but he's just hanging on all yeah. he's doing is just hanging on to just trying to keep some stability so no, I had to. I'll I'll let Steve know. I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> well, you know, it was no, the, you, the you blue eyes. I think, if I recall, it was the blue eyes and the buzz cut, and I don't remember what else, but it just sounded a little <laughs> bit like him. So. Yeah, I I thought more of Steve McQueen and yeah, Bullet. No, no, I can see that now that you say that. Um, yeah. Just to touch on, you're talking about sad things. Uh, you, the GH family set, whatever you want to call it, has had a lot of loss in the last year. Uh, yeah, has that really yeah. changed uh, how things run there? Or just well, no, it hasn't changed how we run anything. It's just you know, I think we're all just really aware of how fragile and and uh, how quickly something can end. Um, you know, it's too bad that people have to pass away before you're reminded of these things. But yeah, we've taken some real hits this year. Yeah, you know, behind, behind the camera and in front of the camera yeah. and. Uh, you know, we miss them all. So, you know, we just try to appreciate each other when we're there. You know, I, know I noticed that. 
nobody nobody raises their voice you know nobody's you know popping off out of anger i oh, noticed right. a lot right yeah there's a uh, the fans are very sad too i know yeah yeah there was a there was a huge outpouring from from people and mm -hmm. uh and we really you know we all heard it and saw it and felt it you know yeah. very proud of that yeah i i know <laughs> all right uh so that wasn't on my list but i just had to mention that um so as a first-time author would you say that you're still learning oh definitely mm -hmm. definitely yeah i'm i'm struggling with book two I was um, saying, if you're gonna, that was my next question. Are you planning yeah. to write more? <laughs> yeah, I, I booked two and book three. I mean, I pitched this really as a series, maybe all of which would have the word Hollywood in the title. They're mm -hmm. all based crime novels. Okay. But, uh, and I try to keep everything grounded the way Elmore Leonard did. You know, that's like, this is a real world, you know, that you find these people walking through. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, I, you know, have, suddenly being a bestseller and seeing four stars from everywhere, from Amazon to Barnes and Noble, um, gives you a nice kick of confidence. So sure, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm looking back to, I'm getting ready to get back into it. I bought two of them. I bought the, the oh, thank you. version and the um, audio version. So oh, all right. Which I recorded in my basement. I know. I saw, oh, in your basement. <laughs> in my basement, yeah. I have a little collapsible frame with these acoustic blankets. Wow. It's not a whisper room, which is like silent, but it is fine. But I still have to I have to stop yeah. for helicopters and dogs and leaf blowers. <laughs> yeah. It's like I, that. I, I'm, I'm torn between. I'm not a big books on tape, what they call. I don't know what they call now, audio uh, fan, uh, because I read really fast. But I wanted to hear your voice and, and hear it that way while while I was you know, doing other things. So I, I keep going back and forth. But I really like the accents that you do and the voices. That's oh, great. great. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Uh, you have a lot of practice from all the voiceovers. Yeah, I, 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 had a, <laughs> I had a little bit of a, you know, an easy runway to get on that airfield. So there. I have a tough question. So you can feel free not to answer it if you don't like it. Uh, okay. I've read many good reviews and a few bad ones. Uh, some criticize you for being overly descriptive. Is that your <laughs> intended writing style, or do you plan to cut back on some of the description in your future novels? You know, I would say, what's the matter? You never read Stephen King? Because, <laughs> um, you know, if there's anybody who knows how to, how to uh, describe a place, and place is very important. Uh, you know, I, listen, you got to take you got to take the bad with the good mm -hmm. and you're not going to make everybody happy. There was one guy who, uh, who took issue with my ver with my description of, of firearms. Oh, I saw that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know what? He's fair enough. He can have his opinion, but I grew up around guns and his, his point was technically correct. Right. There are automatic weapons, but those are divided into semi-automatic and fully automatic. But when you discern between an automatic weapon or a revolver, mm -hmm. as in a single or double action revolver, you don't need those descriptions. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Right. So, you know, it's funny. He knocked me off half a star or something <laughs> for that. But you know what? Hey, listen, the guy's got his opinion and that's what he'd like to read. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, you know, the point is he he still liked the book and the story. So, you know, I say thank you. <laughs> um, are but, you, you know, you can't you can't get bogged down in this, you know, yeah. this, this thing of, you know, I mean, that's one guy and, yeah. he, and he's entitled to that opinion, as is anybody who says, you know, he overwrites the description. Well, it is about L.A. It's yeah. also about Hollywood, you know, so, you know, you know, you can gloss yeah, over. You're stuff. right. You don't yeah. have to. You don't have to get mired in it, you know, yeah. <laughs> law that says you have to do that too. Yeah, that's, uh, it. you know, they're different writing styles and you can't say one is yeah, better just or worse than the other. Different styles and different taste. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's fine. I mean, somebody who really knows LA, I can see why they would go, oh man, this is really overridden. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, but somebody who doesn't, and I hear this more than I hear the opposite, they're, they really appreciate the, the description of, 
characters and backstory and setting and mm -hmm. you know and all that stuff so yeah. That's good. Yeah. Like I say, you can't you can't please yeah. everybody. And as an it's actor, wrong. as an actor, you're used to people criticizing you and rejecting you and giving you bad reviews and all that stuff. So it, you probably yeah. have an edge over the average writer. <laughs> it just yeah, it just comes with the uh, it just comes with the territory. Now, talking about GA Schmidt, do you uh, still enjoy playing Kevin even without Ryan? Uh, yeah, well, I like Kevin very much. I think Kevin's a really good guy. Um, I think that there's there's been kind of a we, we've kind of lost a little bit of Kevin along the way. You know, remember when Kevin was was first around and we had first gotten rid of of Ryan. Kevin was an artist. He was a psychiatrist, but he was an artist who lived in a in a lighthouse hmm. and painted all the time to yeah, paint out his demons. <laughs> And um and we've kind of we've kind of veered away from that and uh you know we have some new writers coming in now so I think that I I think we're gonna have some um, I think there's gonna be some changes okay uh, in how Kevin but you know to, I mean that's a long answer but to answer right. your question you know I love playing Kevin that's I love. Good. You know, I love playing Kevin. I love playing Ryan. I love I love working with Jeannie. I love working with Lynn Herring and, you know, and Ken Schreiner and everybody that that goes along in Kevin's world. You know, he's yeah, to me, it's just fun. There's so many great um, stories that Kevin has had over the years, although my favorite, I have to say, is on Port Charles. I believe it was the Miracles Happen uh book they called it yeah. uh, when he and lucy got remarried and the little girl came showed up the, yeah yeah but even though later i think they took the little girl away and he got divorced and all that stuff but that was my favorite because <laughs> it was so christmasy and so happy and and yeah. it's like we rarely get enough of those moments in the soap, so. yeah that's true you know i i love doing uh i love doing poor charles it was yeah, like this uh you know it was like the little half hour that could mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and I'm I know that there was somebody at the network paying attention, but it never felt like that. It always felt like yeah. we could just it was like our secret corner of daytime TV where we could do whatever we wanted. Mm -hmm. I saw the the executive producer the other day, Julie Hayden Carruthers, and mm -hmm. uh she she said the same thing. <laughs> she goes, I I know there was somebody at the network, but every time we said we'd like to do this, they just said, okay. <laughs> Oh, wow. but, you know that's great you know and we got the vampires and we got the, the oh yeah the six week books the telenovela style and it was awesome. really fun things so. oh yeah such a, i'm such a huge fan of that show um but i just it just occurred to me didn't kevin write a novel general homicide general homicide so, yeah. <laughs> and it foretold your future there you go <laughs> let's hope nobody in, gets killed in a way, yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> in a way i you know i i wanted to um you know but it's they would never go for it but uh but i had this idea that kevin could walk into the room and and laura is is reading hollywood hustle oh. <laughs> i said oh what you're reading oh it's hollywood hustle i said oh how is it oh it's good oh yeah is it better than <laughs> general homicide and have her say better <laughs> <laughs> that's funny kevin will take a double take <laughs> yeah i guess the thing that most annoys me about it is that they kevin has a daughter out there that they never mention livy yeah livy. i mean she might be dead a oh, vampire or something she but... looks just <laughs> like kelly monaco so i know well they, <laughs> she could do a twin role you know <laughs> she could yeah but it's just yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things that we left on the on the floor, you know, with uh, yeah. with uh, general general homicide slash Port Charles. <laughs> so um how different is it now on GH as opposed to when you started over 30 years ago? Well, the main thing that's changed is the structure of production because you know the you know budgets everywhere have just been constricted to the point right. of not being choked, but you know, and this is true, I mean, virtually on every show that I work on, because I do a lot of work outside of General Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything is just so damn expensive now that sometimes it can feel like if you cut $10 off the budget, you wouldn't be able to make the week. <laughs> but somehow they managed to do it. I think Frank Valentini is a terrific producer. 
you know, the, the shows themselves, the airtime has been cut down from, I think, 49 minutes and change, the rest being advertising during right. the hour, down to about 36 minutes wow. and change. So, um, and yet, you know, ABC keeps pumping money into it. You know, it was right before the pandemic, I think. I went up to the editing bay and they were putting in a brand new Avid system. Hmm. So the, you know, the network is still investing money into that show. They feel it's, it's viable for the future. So, right. you know, and the main thing is uh, you have to show up with your track shoes on. You don't get to kind of feel your way through scenes and rehearsals anymore. Right. You need to, you need to show up and do your job quickly and efficiently. And uh, so now that you're a writer, is it is it harder for you to say other writers' lines? No, <laughs> no, you don't no, say. Oh, no. I wish they would have written it this way. Or no, but you know, I mean, we have a lot of permission to just transpose or paraphrase things as long as you get the thought across. Because you know, the writers in daytime are very good and they know the rule. If it doesn't move the story forward or expose character, get rid of it. That's and they, they're pretty good at trimming things down to those two rules. Yeah. So there's really not much you have to change. And if you were to change it, you might be messing up something that's going to happen tomorrow. You know, right. So, right. And yeah, so, uh, you posted that you're playing a president, the president in a new movie. Can you tell us about the new movie? Oh, it was a, what is, it's called a proof of concept short. Oh, okay. Um, so it's asked, not full movie yet. Yeah. I was asked to come down to, to Dallas and, play the president for a day hmm. while they put together um a uh essentially a proof of concept reel hmm. that would show that this movie could work hmm. on a as a film so i spent the day it was <laughs> that's why i have a cold right now because i <laughs> pushed myself a little too hard over the last week or two um yeah so i spent the day working with jesse metcalf who's a lovely guy hmm. i had worked with him on something before um okay or nine years ago and and uh and then i had to deliver a page and a half monologue as the president and i did it in one take wow that's great well that's that silver so star daytime you. comes in handy oh yeah i was going to mention we we're talking about bosch they had a lot of <laughs> former daytime stars on there oh sure yeah they the, that's what was beautiful about bosch they they didn't there's other places that will say oh they were on daytime we don't yeah. want them. bosch doesn't care yeah. You were either right for the part or you weren't. And if you were right for it, they didn't mind what your background was. As long as as long as you could walk and talk and not trip over the furniture, um, <laughs> they were happy. They wanted people who knew what they were doing. I mean, it's such a silly um prejudice to have because you guys usually are better actors and better prepared and know everything and can do so much than than anyone well, really except maybe stage people i don't know even that yeah yeah you know, i you know listen i liken it to uh to people who knock country music mm. usually don't even listen to country yeah, music that's true and the same people who go oh well they're on soap opera they don't what do they know they don't know or, anything or the people who say oh rap yeah they, yeah exactly <laughs> you know the fact is you can dance to rap yeah. <laughs> you know, may not be able to dance to uh death metal but you can dance to rap <laughs> There's a lot of people um, my age who are prejudiced against it because we didn't grow up with it. And this new thing yeah. came along and took over the radio. And that's yeah. it. Our parents hated the Beatles, too. You know? Exactly. Yeah. I think we were My right. mom loved the Beatles, but that was, I think yeah. she was an outlier. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about your book or GH or any other upcoming work that you have? You know, I'm a, I'm a busy guy. I, you know... I try to put everything up online. If you're curious about what I'm doing, uh, what book signings I'll be doing, I'll be doing one. Actually, I don't know when this goes up, but I've got one on the 17th of February in Glendale with Michael Easton, uh, who is I a terrific that. author in his, no, in his own right. Yeah. And Michael's just such a talented guy. But we're going to sit down and talk at the Barnes and Noble over there. Right. Two o'clock Saturday, February 17th, the Americana at Brand. Then I'm going to be flying to New York for the 27th uh, at the Mysterious Bookshop. I'll be in Portland, actually technically Beaverton at Powell's Bookstore because it's the Beaverton place they do their mystery and thriller events. Wow. And uh, and then we're looking at uh, Petaluma, St. Louis, Raleigh, North Carolina, Phoenix. Wow, you're Kansas not home City. much. <laughs> I'm not home much. I you know I'm a busy guy. 
But I know um, your wife is not home much either. She's always flying somewhere. So <laughs> she's always flying somewhere. And I, I have to show the new cover. Oh, nice. With, you know, the publisher sent that to me there where it says oh. USA Today bestseller. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah. Was great. that backwards to you? Does it look no, backwards? No, it looks fine to me. Oh, okay. It looks backward on my side, but that's. Oh, yeah. That's technical stuff so, oh very I meant, exciting um, I, I meant to mention that um yeah I, I just happened i'm behind on gh about a little less than a month but i happened to see that kevin and laura are gonna uh are yeah. gonna adopt ace yes After yes kevin and, got put in the uh, hospital by ace's mother <laughs> by ace's mother yeah uh -huh. you know i do wish we had a little more kevin esme time yeah you know, for them to work out their stuff but um because i and you know, i love working with avery paul i think she's just a wonderfully gifted actress but um but yeah i i like that they decided to do that and based on what i've seen online boy there's a lot of grandparents out there who are taking on their grandchildren to sure. raise yeah so if we're gonna do it i hope we do it in a in a real way where it's uh you know it's a it's a huge undertaking for anybody to be a parent and uh I'd like to see it. So, but you know, like I say, we've got new writers okay. coming in. They've already started, so we'll see That's what uh, yeah, see what they I, decide to do. You know, we're I all just, pretty excited. I just don't want the um, Laura and Kevin to be stuck in the grandparent mode and not doing anything else. Is that no? no <laughs> we'll try and avoid that. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I'll again, send you a... Sorry about this froggy oh, voice. <laughs> it doesn't sound that bad, honestly. Um, okay. um, I have to send you a picture I have uh, that I took a uh, years ago, like 99. Uh, I went to GH uh, convention that they have the uh, fan club events and mm -hmm. I have a picture with you. So. <laughs> oh, great. Send that to me. Yeah, I'll just... All right. I'm going to try to get this out as soon as possible. I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much.